Okay, well, hello, everybody. It appears we are live. I am excited to be joining you here today for a live stream um, content delivery and Q&A session, depending on how much time we have. And so for today, I'm excited to dive into our topic because I think it is one that really lies at the foundation of a lot of a lot of what people in my community struggle with. So I'm looking forward to to diving that in, into that here today. And so what we are going to be talking about is if I can pull up my notes here. Here we go. Okay. So what we're going to be talking about here today is five simple, if not easy, steps to cure a fear of dying alone. And so if you have made it into my group on Facebook and or onto my subscriber list for YouTube and or my mailing list, then I am going to go ahead and assume that you probably want a passionate relationship, preferably with someone who is over the moon in love with you. You would like to attract a partner with an open heart, a confident attitude, and the ability to just sweep you off your feet. You'd absolutely love it if you had an unlimited number of high quality, you know, potential partners just kind of tripping over themselves to be that person for you. Or if you're already in a relationship, you'd like to see your partner showing up with a little more enthusiasm for a long lasting intimate commitment. But usually there is only one problem. To achieve those things, you would need to believe that it's possible. And at the very least, you may have to be willing to put yourself out there. And typically that means that you have to address your fears and old patterns of living and loving that have kept you stuck in a cycle of pain, self-blame, and what I call scarcity attitudes about love. But here's the thing, you have those fears for a reason. Life has only proven to you over and over again that those fears aren't just your imagination, they are reality which means that you don't know how to recognize when and where your beliefs are tripping you up and holding you back, all right? And as a result, you wind up creating the very outcome that you are attempting to avoid. So for example, if I find a partner, then I will finally be happy, solves the unconscious or even sometimes conscious fear of, I am afraid of dying alone. But if we're gonna peel back a few layers you usually find some more beliefs, like I cannot be happy without a partner, or I'm not in charge of my own happiness. Someone or something else is. Having a romantic partner is the only thing that makes my life meaningful. I'm not valuable unless someone chooses me to be their partner. If I take charge of my happiness, there won't be any room for someone else in my life. If I'm successful and happy on my own, my friends who share in my misery, will leave me, okay, or envy me, and thus I will be rejected, okay? So if you're struggling with fearful beliefs like this and you're interested in turning this around, I invite you to stick with me throughout the length of this video because I'm gonna share five simple, if not easy, steps to help cure fears like this. And before I get into it, if you're new to my channel, welcome. My name is Brianna McWilliam, and I am a licensed and board certified creative arts therapist, author, and educator. And it's my mission to help adults struggling with insecure attachment go from self-doubting to self-sovereign and call in those soul-shaking passionate partnerships that they want without having to talk in circles around their feelings for hours or even years on end with no tangible results. And I do this using the McWilliam method, which is comprised of three core principles and steps. And that is cognitive reframing, body activation and arts-based experiential. And here today, we are going to dig a little bit into some cognitive reframing. So if you haven't yet, I invite you to subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, because if you like this content, you wanna make sure you get notifications for more. So let's dive in to today's topic. Now, when we realize that we are unconsciously operating under fear-based beliefs like I'm afraid of dying alone because having a romantic partner is the only thing that makes my life meaningful and thus me valuable, okay? It can really get us into trouble because we start doing things like settling for less than what we truly desire, 
remaining with incompatible partners and in unhappy relationships, looking to external sources of validation that are intended to confirm our internal experiences, determining that we must lower our expectations and figure out how we can stop being so needy, right? Suffer low self-esteem and turn a lot of anger, anger in on ourselves. Or we people please to the point of self-abandonment and end up violating our own boundaries. And so when we fall into traps like these, we essentially stop showing up for ourselves. We numb out on wine or we binge watch Netflix and we make love to burritos. <laughs> Guilty as charged on that one. And why do we do that to ourselves? Well, it's a protective response that indicates a distrust of our own ability to survive in the face of emotional threat or adversity. So it's like when you watch those alien invasion movies and the military's response is always to try to blow them up first. So these are kind of like those people who are always way too scared of vulnerability. So they tend to self-sabotage to eliminate the threat of intimacy. And then in those movies, there's always the scientists as well, right? And they want to they wanna figure out, how are we going to talk to the aliens first? And these are the type of people who are over-intellectualizing, right? They try to think their way out of having to deal with anxiety or risking being hurt in an intimate situation, right? And then we have the hippie protesters, right? They show up to the landing site and they're immediately ready to receive these aliens before they even know what their intentions are. And these are kind of like those folks that wear their heart on their sleeve and they sometimes ignore their own safety just for a whiff of attention and approval, right? So what would be the solution to all of this? Well, today I'm here to propose that the solution is actually a simple five-step process, but just because it's simple does not make it easy, okay? But let's see if we can go through these here together. So the first one is, I want you to take a good, hard look at the thing you think you want. A good, hard look at the thing you think you want. Secondly, recognize if that thing is actually an authentic need or really a band-aid for a fear-based fear a fear-based belief, I should say. And usually you can determine that by asking yourself at least seven why questions. Why do I want that? Why do I want that? Why is that important to me? Why, why, why? Ask yourself seven why questions. The third step is to acknowledge and name whatever those fearful beliefs might be. And again, it might take you seven why questions to get there. Number four, recognize the deep spirit-based desire on the backside of those fears. And number five, practice adopting new beliefs that support the deeper desire, okay? So we're gonna slow down a little bit and go through this here together. So let's tackle number one. If the want is something that is being expressed, okay, so again, this is the external want. So if the want is something that is being expressed, sounds something like, if I find a partner, I will finally be happy, okay? So that's kind of an external want, right? So if you're following along with me, I invite you to just type there in the comments or in the chat box, what is your external want? That's number one. Number two, this is the unconscious or even sometimes conscious fear, okay? So again, number two is recognizing if that is an authentic need or a Band-Aid for a fear-based belief. So. Is that external want that you just typed in the comment box, the chat box there, is it an authentic need or is it gonna band-aid a fear-based response? Okay, so let's look at number one, our example. If I find a partner, then I'll finally be happy. Number two, that means the unconscious or even the sometimes conscious fear might be, I'm afraid of dying alone, right? And I'm, I'm accelerating this here because we're on a live stream, but if you have a hard time getting from one to two, just ask yourself seven why questions, okay? Now, number three, acknowledging and naming the fear-based belief. So in this case, in our example here, if the want is I want to find a partner because I think I'll finally be happy, then the unconscious fear is I'm afraid of dying alone. So number three, that means that you have a belief that sounds something like having a romantic partner is the only thing that makes life meaningful and thus me valuable, okay? So, Number four is recognizing the deeper spirited based desire on the backside of that. So in our example, the deeper desire 
is that your that your soul is really screaming for you to acknowledge here is likely to be the polar opposite of the idea that having a romantic partner is the only thing that makes life meaningful and thus you valuable. Okay. And here's a hint. You know that your soul is screaming at you because you're perpetually unhappy and dissatisfied as long as you keep operating under that belief and experiencing the same results in the same types of disappointing relationships. And oftentimes this looks like you finally get that partner and you're in the relationship and you're still not happy right? You find some new thing to be worried about. Now, not only, now you're not just worried about getting in a relationship. Now you're worried about keeping it. There's never any rest. And so what might the deeper desire sound like then? So I'm going to offer you uh, a reframe here. There's no way that I could ever truly be or die alone because I am so tapped in, turned on, and enlivened by all of the connections I experience in a delightful variety of the relationships available to me at all times. Meaning making is never something that is outside of my control, but always squarely within my command because I value myself as the hero of my own story and choose to write a narrative that lights me on fire and keeps the pages turning. I am not afraid to get hurt because I'm fully capable of allowing for hurt feelings as well as many other feelings because they are all a part of the contrast that makes up the grand design of my soul's never ending expansion in this lifetime. So that is what a deeper desire might sound like. And so therefore, number five, what are the new beliefs that you would have to adopt if this were true? So here are a few examples of new beliefs. The universe has my back. There's a grand design that I am a part of. However, I accept that my awakening mind can only fractionally perceive and conceive of it at any given time. There are a myriad of opportunities for me to find fun, adventure, stimulation, and gratification outside of romantic partnership alone. And when I find myself downgrading those experiences, I will acknowledge that that is my ego in operation, defending against fear, shame, and guilt. Love is available to me at all times in a variety of forms. And once I set aside judgment and constant comparison, I will be able to acknowledge, appreciate, and receive those many forms. And that will finally allow me to feel connected and full of love, which will make me a match for a fully loving and available partner. And when I feel depressed and cynical because I am out of sync with the truth of my deepest desire and knowing, all I need to do to find that good feeling place again is to state it out loud and myself to that perspective. Now, I know <laughs> this is easier said than done, and it's really hard to get some perspective when we have been operating under a certain set of beliefs and especially beliefs that have been culturally reinforced by everyone and everything since the day you were born. But if you can learn these basic principles and processes, what I call cognitive reframing and what we have sampled here today, I guarantee that you are going to start to see and feel radical shifts in the way that you experience not only your love relationships, but your life in general. And if you are willing, I would love to see those beliefs that you might come up with in the chat box or the comment there below that you think might support your expanding desire. Now, additionally, if part of what we've gone over or all of what we've gone over here today rings a bell for you, I just want to let you know there is three days left to sign up for my live group coaching series, and I'm calling it Five Days to Ignite Your Love Light. So enrollment ends this April 30th. And the live group coaching calls are going to be held for the first week of May from the 4th through the 8th. And the time is going to be determined based on availability of those that enroll. Now, what does this include? Well, it includes all uh, lifetime access to all of the replays of the lectures, as well as the live Q&A's discussion, which we're going to do in the Zoom space. And we're going to go through a specific curriculum over the course of five days to help you start learning the practices for developing this kind of mindset reset for yourself. So for example, on day one, we're gonna talk about how to take the fear out of your desire and realize that it's not your need that's getting in the way, but rather your beliefs about how to get those needs met. On day two, we're gonna talk about how to identify two important types of limiting beliefs that are holding you back. On day three, we're gonna clear those beliefs and replace them with new ones, kind of like the ones I just shared with you here today, so that you can open yourself up to all the possibilities that exist around you and help you to be able to recognize those possibilities. 
On day four, we're gonna do something a little bit different and very special. I'm going to take you, I'm gonna introduce you to a good friend of mine who is an experienced shaman, and she's gonna take us on a guided shamanic journey to recover, restore, and open up our heart chakra. Okay, and on day five, we are going to talk about how to show up for what I call an ascended love partner, not a soulmate or a twin flame, but a true ascended love partner. And I'm going to explain a lot more about what I mean by that. Now, I have not run a live group coaching program like this in over a year, and I also haven't accepted any new private coaching clients in over a year because I'm usually booked solid. And my live group coaching packages typically cost at least $1,700. But in light of the let's say, unique circumstances that everyone is experiencing around the world right now, I felt compelled to contribute in the ways that I know that I can in the best way that I can. And that is to help generate an energy of love and connection and personal agency in a time when we are experiencing social distancing, survival fears, and really feeling helpless. And so for this one-time opportunity, I am offering five plus hours of live group coaching online for only $97. Now that's half of what it usually costs for an hour long consultation with a counselor. And we're gonna be doing a whole week's worth of going through this. So I would have you consider it kind of like a crash course in rewiring your mindset and generating more magnetic, attractive energy around love. And if you've ever wanted to ask me a question personally about your situation or to learn how does this apply to me in my situation, this is an opportunity to get in on it because each day we meet, we're going to open up an unlimited amount of time for Q&A and you get to join me in the Zoom space and ask those questions. So if you're interested in learning more about that opportunity, there will be a link to that in the caption of this video. Again, you have until April 30th to sign up. And I just want to check out our chat box here to see if we have any questions we can address here today on the call. We have John, we have Madai, welcome. We have Jacqueline, hi there, Damien, Melina, Magical Journey, hi, we have I Am, Roller Girl, hi Roller Girl, and Rebecca, welcome. I just want to give Rebecca a shout out. Rebecca, I just want to say thank you for the amazing illustrations that you've been creating. Everybody should go to check out Rebecca's Instagram. Rebecca, put your Instagram handle there in the chat box because she's got a great way of illustrating these concepts. And I think everybody should go and check out her work. Um, okay, so let's see. I want a healthy relationship. Yeah, always want fun. I assume, I assume if I find a partner, my life will be more exciting. Right, so part of it is reframing that. So a habit that we tend to fall in when we find ourselves thinking we need a partner before we can start feeling excitement is that we think we don't have it within ourselves to generate that excitement for ourselves. So we start thinking about, we become preoccupied with the narratives that are going on in someone else's life, right? And usually the challenge is just to ask yourself, what would, what would I have to be doing in my life to feel as though my narrative and my story and stepping into my life as the hero of this story is at least as interesting, if not more interesting than what's going on out there, right? Um, and even if you're imagining what would I be doing, sometimes it's a useful activity to work from the outside in. So if you think about, you're imagining, well, my life will be more exciting with a partner. So start by thinking about, well, what am I imagining I would be doing with this partner that would be so exciting, right? And then just start doing it. Like, don't wait. Wait for what? Don't wait around. Just start doing it. Um, and you don't have to do it alone. You know, enlist the people that are close to you, that you that support you, that you think might also be engaged with those things to do them with you, right? And then you start putting yourself in the vicinity of people who are already doing those things, right? Um, okay. It's a fear of being single as a woman in my 30s when all of my other female friends have marriage and kids. It's comparison. Well, right, but keep asking yourself why questions, right? Why? Why is that a fear? Why would why why are you afraid of being a single woman in your 30s when all of your other female kids have marriage and kids? Why is that a fear? Right? Keep asking why. Keep going. Um if I was in my 70s, I wouldn't be scared of being single. Why? <laughs> What's the difference? Okay. Just keep asking why. Why, 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 why? 
um, fear of other people saying what they have to say of me. Why? Why are you afraid of what other people have to say with you? Why? What do you care what they think? Um, okay. What it means to be with an ascended love partner. So we're going to talk so much more about that in this in this live group coaching series, but I'll give you a little, little hint. So when we talk about things like true twin flames or, or soulmate relationships, oftentimes what we're talking about is a circumstance where your soul is being stimulated to grow, right? Soulmates are in essence, um, they are kind of a provocative antagonistic type of relationship in which your ego based constructs are being rattled, right? They're being, they're being shaken up. Um, because that is typically necessary in order for you to step into a level of certain soul expansion. Because, and when I say soul expansion, it means a turning inwards, looking at the internal experience and valuing it as much and as frequently as the external experience. So for example, I often talk about this in terms of um, four phases of the romantic journey. And then I talk about there, talk about there being like four types of love as we navigate through that journey. And so, Soulmate slash twin flame love is kind of like um, when you're looking for that soul shaking love. And that sometimes evolves after you've been experiencing what I call buddy love or team spirit for a while, which means you've met someone with whom. Um, so buddy loves kind of like when you're in transient circumstances, like it may have been like a college fling or it could have been, you know, a more or less casual relationship that was very companionable and carried you for a while, but it just kind of comes to its natural conclusion. It could have been someone you met, you know, while you were uh, on traveling for a period of time. Buddy love is more like a, a kind of companionable love and experience where you get to kind of be in um, a more lighthearted place and there is a loving exchange, but you know, it, it serves its purpose and then you kind of move on from it. It's it's not something that typically leaves you wasted, let's say. Then there's team spirit love and team spirit love is kind of like, this is more where you're thinking about things practically and structurally, right? This is people who really view and experience and perceive marriage as like an institution. It's a it's a contract by which within which you agree to structuring your life and your routines and your domestic duties and your your values and your beliefs and your traditions and all of that. You kind of come to an agreement with someone. Um, about those things. And, and it's a, a loving relationship because there is so much amicability over those things. Um, sometimes there isn't amicability over those things, but you do it because you're sort of operating under a certain set of beliefs that you need to establish that security in order to live your life, right? Now, some people stay in team spirit love for the entirety of their lives. That's kind of like what their agenda is on this earth, let's say. But there are some people who experience that and then they arrive at this place where they want something more. They start, they kind of achieve a plateau where they're sort of like, really, is this all there is, right? Um, and and is, is there more to this than that? And so, uh, yes, I do see you there on Facebook. Um, so, at that point, we start, we're like, we're looking to our partners to like enliven us. We're looking to our partners to be, um, to be some source of something that makes us feel more expanded. You know, we're like, and so because we have been operating under an external orientation all this time, we, we still are operating in that way. And, and so sometimes what happens if you are in a long-term relationship, it ends or you have a separation, or there's a hugely rap, like rocky, tumultuous period. Um, and if it ends, the person who is seeking some form of spiritual expansion typically falls into a subsequent relationship that's hot and heavy and catalytic. And it feels like, oh, this is everything I've been missing. And then it ends. And, um, and they're sort of left to feel like they've been laid waste. Um, and then their partner, who was perfectly happy and fine with team spirit love, sometimes ends up finding another partner 
rather quickly and moves on rather quickly. And then the person who was seeking, you know, soul shaking love was like, what the heck? <laughs> um, and it's because you're on different trajectories. The things you're looking for are different. So that soulmate catalytic sis boomba relationship is, and you don't have to have been in a long-term relationship for that to happen. You may have just been operating under a certain, in a certain way for a certain period of time, but then the soulmate comes in. Um, but what happens is it forces you to question everything about yourself. And that's painful because we don't like questioning things about ourselves because that means that we might be wrong. <laughs> and if, if we might be wrong, then that leaves us susceptible to, to feeling vulnerable. And that means we might get hurt. And now we're afraid of everything and we're looking for red flags left and right. Right. But it forces you to question everything about yourself. It forces you to, to ask yourself, wow, I've been the common denominator, you know, in every situation. Um, and so you experience it as really painful. You experience it like a punishment. You experience it like, oh, the world, the universe has it in for me. And, and so you kind of have to go through that. That's like a part of the process. Um, Maureen Murdoch, who was a student of Joseph Campbell, Joseph Campbell wrote uh, the, the book, A Hero with a Thousand Faces, which was an analysis of archetypes and um, cross-cultural analysis of the way the hero's journey manifests their archetypes. Maureen Murdoch was a student of his, and she wrote her own book called The Heroine's Journey. And she describes this as a descent um, into the dark goddess for women. Um, for men in the hero's journey, sometimes it's called the dark night of the soul. But that there is a descent that has to occur. And if you have had a heartbreaking experience with what you felt was a cis boom ba soul shaking relationship, then it's likely it was the thing that pushed you over the edge and now you must descend. And that is all a part of the process. That's all a part of the journey. And the descent is about, in other vernacular, going into the shadow and recovering the parts that you have discarded. And in order to do that, you often have to shed an aspect of your ego identity. And the ego identity will almost always be connected to some aspect of your external reality that you think is necessary to your happiness and survival. Right. And that's going back to what we talked about in this initial discussion, which is step one, the thing you think you want. And what happens in the descent is the thing that you think you want butts up against the thing that you actually need. Right. It butts up against the thing that you actually need. Um, and so when that happens, there is what is often referred to as a surrender, which requires a leap of faith. Right. I, you surrender the thing that you think you want because you decide to take a leap of faith and believe that the thing that you need is actually the most direct path to, let's say, unfolding into who you actually are. And that is a spiritual being that is having a physical experience. And if you can line up with that, once you're able to line up with that, you can kind of release the hows. You can kind of release the A to B equation that we are always holding ourselves in comparison to being, well, I'm not married and have kids and I'm already 30. I'm, I'm behind. <laughs> I don't have the A grade yet. But life is not about that, right? It's not it's not about the A grade. And I know this personally. Oh, like the only reason I'm talking about it in this way is because this was like the entirety of my 30s and my early my my 20s and my early 30s, right? I needed to make the grade. But when we set ourselves up like that, when we set ourselves up to be chasing after some A to B equation, even if it's from insecure to secure, right? And I talk about this more in another video on my channel called Six Signs of a Secure Relationship. And I'm gonna, and also another video called um, How Trying to Heal Keeps You Wounded. Okay, I invite you to, if this is something resonating with you, I invite you to check out those videos. But when we set ourselves up to be running after some kind of A to B equation, then what happens is you create a space between A and B. And we're always preoccupied with that space in between, right? And so when that happens, it means that I'm either succeeding or I'm not succeeding. And when you set up a circumstance in which you are always succeeding or not succeeding, now you've generated three things. And that is fear, guilt, and shame. Okay. Fear about succeeding or not succeeding. There's a fear of success just as much as there's a fear of failure and guilt over what you had to do or what you didn't do to succeed or not succeed and shame over what you had to do or what you didn't do in order to succeed or not succeed. Right. And, and all of that, all of that now becomes a barometer 
for how valuable you are, for what worthiness you have in this lifetime, just inherently, right? Um, and there's no way you're ever going to catch up with that. That's a carrot hanging in front of your face. There's no way you were ever going to be able to catch up to that. But if you can, so, and so what we do, it, it creates a constant state of anxiety. And so what we do to try to mitigate that anxiety, because we are in a perpetual external focus, we think, I know, I know, I'm going to become preoccupied with assuming power over the players in this game. And, and we figure out what methods we can use to exert power over the other players in this game, because we think somehow we can manipulate the pieces on the board. OK, and that, again, never going to win it, never going to win it because you cannot control things that you cannot control, including other people. OK, and then when even if you try to control them, then you will always be doubting what comes from them, whether it is authentic or not, because you'll be afraid that you bullied them into it. So there's no way that you can ever win in this A to B equation. Right. So so what do you do instead? Instead what you do is you sink into yourself, you um, unfold into yourself, you notice how you are responding to your stimulus and to your environment. And instead of responding by trying to control, mitigate, manipulate, and or push the pieces around on, try to predict your opponent's moves, you just release it. You allow them to reveal themselves to you. You, and trust that you will be okay that you are resilient no matter what. And so all you do is focus on your pieces and you notice what feels good to move in this way. Does it feel good to move in that way? Does this delight me? Does that feel playful? Am I amused if I go in that direction? Do I feel a sense of curiosity and engagement if I make this move instead of that? And you allow the next step to reveal itself to you. And once you do, your environment will respond to you. And as it responds to you, more and more information unfolds as you allow it, especially when you stop trying to, to, to filter the information you're receiving through a very specific lens, i.e. the A to B equation, right? Your desire for a specific outcome. It must look this way, right? Instead now, you are opening up to seeing the whole picture. And when you do that, people reveal themselves to you. And we don't always want people to reveal themselves to us. Why? Because then we get to see ourselves in response to who they really are. And we're not always trusting of who we really are because we don't know. And we're afraid that if I turn that external focus in on myself, what if I find nothing? What if I figure out that I'm a black hole? What if I'm not valuable? Okay, so here's the paradox. We're going to get super deep here. I wasn't going to go here today, but let's play with it. Here's the paradox. <laughs> On some level, you're not wrong. <laughs> On some level, you're not wrong. You know, Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey has a wonderful quote where he talks about how when he assumed the character of Andy Kaufman, he realized that he could lose himself in a character. He realized that he could become a character. And if he could become a character, then who was Jim Carrey? If he could take that whole identity, set it aside and assume an entirely new one, then what was that? Then what was that, I, that Jim Carrey identity? And how much choice did he have around assuming it again? Was it just a conglomerate of all the different conditionings and stories and things that had been given to him over a lifetime? And if it was simply a, a, an act of assuming one identity over another, who? what was the part of him that was able to switch them out like that? Like putting on a new a pair of shoes. That is the nothingness that we're talking about here. And, and that's why I'm that's why I don't think you can really heal any heal, any attachment wound without assuming a spiritual stance, without realizing that you have to get in touch with these things, right? So I want to give you a metaphor for this. Imagine that you have a fish swimming in the ocean, okay? And you say to the fish, hey, look at that water molecule. And the fish is like, what water molecule? And you're like, the one right there in front of your face. And the fish is going to be like, I don't see any water mo molecule. It's ridiculous to ask a fish to look at a water molecule because that one, mo one water molecule becomes invisible amidst the context of the billions upon billions upon trillions of other water molecules that exist in the ocean in which it is swimming. So in essence, when you tell a fish to look at a water molecule, 
you're telling it to look at nothing and it will see nothing. It will see nothing in front of its face, right? But we all know it's not nothing. We all know that if we look really closely, there is a water molecule there. And in fact, that water molecule is not nothing. That water molecule is the foundation upon which every, that the, the very thing that is keeping this fish alive. And if we look at the fish closely enough, we realize that that fish is also made up primarily of water molecules. But that fish, that fish's water molecules have managed to achieve some kind of focus and energetic momentum that allows it to look like fins and shiny scales and gills. And there's something precious and unique and beautiful and special about the way they are looking and behaving and clustering together in a certain energetic vibration, right? And so we have to reckon, but yet, and yet, and yet, it is still primarily made up of the thing in which it is actually swimming. But the point I want to make here is that you are nothing and you are everything at the same time time. And so our purpose is not to go from A to B. Our purpose is to cycle between. And as we start doing that expansion and that contraction from one to the other, we start recognizing that we are not just at A. We are A, we are B, and we are the space in between. And that it is a non-linear process that we are in here in this lifetime. And it is a non-linear process that we are constantly experiencing most poignantly in our relationships, I would say, because we experience our life force, our life force energy and our vitality so quintessentially in our romantic relationships, okay? But this, let's say, paradigm exists in every other facet of our lives, relationships, career, creative projects, whatever it is that you set your mind and intention to, okay? So, all of this is to bring it back, is that when we can stop setting up comparisons, and I appreciate someone offering that word here in the feed, if we can stop setting up comparisons, then you can start releasing things like fear, guilt, and shame. And you can stop worrying about whether you're succeeding or not succeeding. And when you can stop doing that, then you can sink into the idea that it's not felt security is not about making yourself better than you are. It's about approving your really improving your relationship to who you are right now. And that is not a process of power plays and manipulation. That is a process of lovingly and compassionately observing, ex tolerating, accepting, and eventually having compassion towards yourself for who you are in this very moment and allowing that to be a process that is fun and playful and entertaining and delightful and does not have to be some heavy burden. Okay. Okay. So... I wanted to, that's, that's, I talked a lot more today than I was <laughs> anticipating. Um, okay, I just want to check on some of these questions. Is it possible to, possible to attend from a different time zone? Um, in terms of the five days to ignite your love light, all of the replays will be available. Like You have lifetime access to them. Um, and we're going to probably stagger the calls because we have a few people in the States, but we also have a few people across the pond. So it's likely they will be a couple staggered calls. So we can try to get at least a couple live calls in for everybody. Um, okay. Um, I've been at that stage and surprise. I'm about the exact point where I've been two years ago. So how is this around circle? That's a good question. So, so sometimes what happens is we go through a period of self-reflection. We go through a period of self-reflection, we've done a lot of inner work, and then we feel like, okay, I'm ready to take the training wheels off. And so you kind of coast for a while and you do well because you've learned some new skills and attributes and you've expanded into a new knowledge or corner of yourself. And then something hits you. And all of the things that you thought that you processed and got over, oh, I thought I dealt with my mommy issues. Oh, I thought I dealt with my daddy issues. Oh, I thought that I wasn't triggered by those kinds of things anymore. And all of a sudden you're hit with it. You're hit with it again. It's like a wall or like a tsunami. It just hits you. And you're like so frustrated and angry with yourself because <laughs> you're like, again, really? I thought I, I thought I fixed this. But here's the thing. 
you never get over your mommy issues or your daddy issues. There is, I believe, in this lifetime, a curriculum. And at the core of that curriculum, there's usually one or two things that are always rubbing up against each other. And every time around, you revisit those two things with a new and expanded perspective. It's kind of like in psychology, they have an expression, it's called regression in service of the ego. Um, but it's the idea that sometimes you have to take two steps back in order to go three steps forward. So for example, let's say you've got, I'm hold this up, you've got two core things. So usually people know deep in their heart if they ask themselves seven why questions, what those two things are. So in my circumstance, I would say, and if you're here in my community, this might resonate with you too, love and rejection. So in your curriculum, you'll have two core things, love and rejection. For some, it might be something else like success and failure or whatever else, you know, in our community it might be love and rejection. So that means that every circumstance, every circumstance in my life that I find difficult, likely at the core of it, you will find these two things in opposition on some iteration. So let's say my first life experiences of love and rejection start at this circumference, right? They, they start here and, you know, maybe it was my first love, right? And then I learned something about myself and, and in learning something about myself, now I start to expand out into a wider circumference. Okay, so I do another rotation around those two core issues. Life goes on, ba, 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 whoop, hit another relationship. Maybe this time um, I'm, I'm again dealing with the same issue, but I've got a broader perspective on it. It might feel like a regression, but it's just because I'm revisiting old stuff from a new perspective. New information gets integrated. Okay, now I keep going. New information gets integrated. Keep going around and around and around and around. Whoop. Another relationship. Ah, oh, I'm still stuck <laughs> being in, in relationship to that center point, right? That's still my core issue. Yes, it's still your core issue. It will probably be your core issue for the rest of your life. I'm going to spoil, spoiler alert, right? That's not the goal. That's not the A to B equation. The A to B equation isn't to eliminate this altogether. The A to B equation is to recognize that this is a process that you are going to be going through for the rest of your life. So what's the goal then? What is my aim? Your aim is to recognize that this is one hell of a ride. <laughs> this is a fun ride to be on. It is. This is really enjoyable. This can be the best ride of your life, right? You don't go on an amusement park ride to be able to get off, right? You don't get on a roller coaster in order to get off the roller coaster. You get, which is literally only like five minutes later, right? If that. You get on the roller coaster for the ride. You get on the roller coaster because you want to feel that rush. You want to feel the ups and the downs because that makes you feel alive. So, so that's what you're going to be. That's, that's what you want to do. There's no after that, Damien. There's no after that. That's the point. <laughs> There's no after that. It's a constant expansion and contraction. There's a constant expansion and contraction. So if that's the case, it's not about, what's that other quote? Um, I'm not going to tell you. I can't remember who it's by, and I'm probably going to botch it. But there's a quote, you know, a ship, a ship at port is a safe ship, but that's not what ships are built for, Right? Ships are built to be set to sail. So you need to sail, right? It keeps going. It continues forever. That's the point. The goal is to find enjoyment in the ride, is to learn how to ride the waves, right? Um, so I, I do see other comments there in the chat box, and, um, and I will be addressing those. I'm coming back for another live stream tomorrow and the next day at the same time, 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I will take note of the other comments uh, and questions here on the on the feed, and we will try to address some of those in the Q&A part of the discussion tomorrow. I look forward to seeing you then, and thank you to everybody who joined me here today. I hope you have a great evening.